I'm going to be talking about Henry Wirtz, who was the commandant of Andersonville prison camp during the Civil War, uh, who was charged after the Civil War uh, with committing war crimes and atrocities at Andersonville prison. Um, and you may or may not know, but um, since that uh, time, um, some historians and, and others have come to question um, how responsible was Henry Wirtz for the conditions at Andersonville and what happened there? Um, so we're going, I'm going to walk you through um, who Henry Wirtz was, his background, um, the background of Andersonville prison and how it came to be such a notorious prisoner of war camp during the Civil War. And then we're going to walk through uh, his trial, um, the charges that were made against him, the evidence that was presented and ultimately the verdict of the trial. Um, and then we can talk in the discussion later, if you wish, about whether or not um, you think uh, he was as responsible as uh, the commission found him. So let's get started. First, I'll start by talking a little bit about who Henry Wirtz was. Wirtz was not an American by birth. He was born in Zurich, Switzerland um, in 1828. He was the son of a tailor, um, but Henry Wirtz always had aspirations. He wanted to be a physician. Um, unfortunately, his family did not have the means to send him uh, to university to get medical training. So instead, he uh, became, you know, he went into business um, and became a merchant and worked for one of, I believe, the biggest sort of uh, stores um, in Zurich. Now, at some point, it's not entirely clear what he was charged with uh, or what exactly he had done, but he was sentenced to prison, to 12 years in prison, um, for some kind of fraud or embezzlement. It's really not clear exactly what that was. Um, and uh, his sentence was commuted, um, but he was uh, exiled from Switzerland. So he had to leave the country. For a little while, he went to Moscow, and then eventually he made his way to the United States uh, around 1848. He settled in Kentucky, actually a town called Hopkinsville in central Kentucky, which is actually not very far from where I was born and raised um, in the central part of Kentucky. Uh, there he met and married uh, a widow, um, and eventually, um, uh, before I get to that part, uh, the important part to note about his time in Kentucky is where he began to kind of become an apprentice of a local physician, a local doctor. Um, and that's where he kind of began to um, kind of actualize uh, the dream he had always had to become a doctor. Um, and in the United States, uh, in the 19th century, there were some professional medical schools uh, where one could go and get professionalized medical training, but it wasn't required. And so many doctors, particularly country doctors in rural areas, simply learned the profession by sort of studying with and working alongside a more experienced doctor. And so this was what Henry Wirtz was doing um, in the sort of late 1840s, early 1850s while he was living in Kentucky. Eventually, he and his wife moved to Louisiana, where he became uh, an overseer on a, on, a, on a sugar plantation. So an overseer, he was sort of the manager of the plantation, managed the, the production of the sugar cane, and also uh, managed the enslaved people in Louisiana who would be working um, in that production. Uh, and he also set up a practice, a medical, a local medical practice at the time. And so this is what Henry Wirtz was doing um, in the early 1860s when the Civil War broke out. Uh, and like many men, uh, as Southern men, he uh, enlisted in a local regiment as a private in the Confederate service uh, when the war broke out in a Louisiana regiment. He saw action at the Battle of Seven Pines in May of 1862, and that was in Virginia. He was injured severely at that battle um, and actually 
ultimately lost use of his right arm. And you can sort of see in this photograph here, he's holding his arm uh, sort of close to his body. That's because he didn't have much use of it. Professor, he, excuse me, we don't yes. we can see your screen. What's that? Are you sharing your screen? Because we can't, I am, yeah. We can't see it. Oh, okay. Let's see here. Let's go back. I'm so sorry. Um, let's try again. There you go. There we go. Sorry about that, folks. I'm really sorry. Um, so yeah, here's this picture of Henry Mertz. Um, so you can sort of see him there holding his right arm because he has lost use of it. He was cited for valor um, at the Battle of Seven Pines, and he was promoted to, to the rank of captain. Um, but his, his, his soldiering days were over because of his injury. Um, and ultimately what happens is he is assigned to be the assistant, sort of the in the military called the adjutant. He was the assistant to General Winder, who was uh, sort of in control or overseeing uh, the system of Confederate prison of war camps, all of the Confederate prison of war camps. And so um, from, um, you know, in the mid 1860s, this is what he's doing. He's helping General Winder sort of oversee um, Confederate prison camps all over the South. And for a time, I think he's stationed at one in Alabama. He also uh, works at some of the prison camps in, Rich in and around Richmond, Virginia. But it's not until 1864 um, that he becomes the commandant of Andersonville Prison. I'm sure most of you have heard of Andersonville Prison because it is so notorious. Um, it opened in the spring of 1864. Uh, and, and actually, it wasn't ever finished. There were supposed to be in the initial plans for Andersonville Prison, which was located in sort of southwestern Georgia, kind of in the middle of nowhere, near the town of Anderson, which is how it gets its name, Andersonville. The, the actual, the official name, the Confederate name for the camp was Camp Sumter. Um, but it, of course, it's known today as Andersonville Prison. Um, the barracks that were supposed to house approximately up to 10,000 uh, prisoners of war uh, were never completed. So basically all Andersonville prison was, was a 16 acre square open stockade. So there was very, there was no shelter for the prisoners who eventually would end up there. Um, and uh, you can see here in this first picture um, that some of the men have obviously put up and constructed some kind of makeshift shelters with tents and clothing and things like that. So these men had to live, you know, exposed to all of the elements, rain, cold, and of course, the, you know, terrible southern heat. Um, and they were, were exposed like that. Um, and they were incredibly malnourished. There wasn't enough food. There wasn't enough medical care. Um, there was no, um, system for, um, eliminating waste, um, from the camp. Um, there are, uh, the men are digging latrines, but they're also the latrines, it, you know, the, the, the water supply to the camp. There's a little stream that runs into the camp that, you know, the, the men are drinking that water and they're also, you know, defecating and using the bathroom in it as well. So sickness is rampant. Disease is rampant. As I mentioned, Andersonville is only really intended to house a to you know less than 10,000. Ultimately, it's housed at its peak around August and September of 1864 up to 32,000 union prisoners. So it's incredibly overcrowded. Uh sickness is rampant. Uh there is not enough food of any kind to go around. Um so the conditions are really terrible there. And the death rate is very high. I think as Fiona mentioned, nearly eight, uh, 13,000 Union prisoners die there. It had a, a fatality rate in the camp of 
hovering around nearly 29%, which is incredibly high. Now, um, how did the conditions at Andersonville get so bad? This is one of the big questions uh, that came up during Wirtz's trial. How did the conditions get so terrible? And to what extent was he, as the commandant of the prison camp, responsible for it? The reason that Andersonville is so overcrowded um, is because of the breakdown in the prisoner exchange system that had existed up until 1863 between the Union and Confederate armies. So basically what would happen um, is that any prisoners of war, uh, and this included officers as well as, as enlisted privates, periodically, the armies would do a formal exchange of prisoners. And they did this for the simple reason that it is very difficult the, you know, to take care of large numbers of prisoners of war, um, to provide for them, to feed them, to house them. It's very difficult to do that. And so they wanted to avoid it as much as possible. And the, as the war is going on and on and on year after year, um, they want to minimize this because it is a huge drain on the resources of both sides. So they want to exchange the prisoners. So when some, when a prisoner was offered what was called a parole, um, he is supposed to sort of promise to go home, put down his weapon, and not take up weapons against uh, the other side again. And they would sign a parole. And here's uh, one uh, typical one you can see here. Now, not everyone uh, obeyed the promise they had made on their parole. So in many cases, those men went straight back into service, uh, even though technically they weren't supposed to, they had promised not to do that, which made some commanders on both sides, you know, very kind of um, skeptical um, and opposed to doing too much prisoner swapping because, you know, they thought, well, you know, we're just sending men back into the army to come back at us and fight us and kill our own men. Um, so there was kind of a catch-22 with the, with the parole system. But basically, uh, the parole system was in place to keep the levels of prisoners down, to make it a manageable uh, kind of thing um, and not put too much of a burden of caring for prisoners of war on either side, okay? But this breaks down. Why does it break down? Basically, it starts in 1863 in January with the Emancipation Proclamation. Once Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, a part of that proclamation allows for the enlistment of Black men into the Union forces. As you can imagine, the Confederate uh, uh, leadership um, is outraged by this. Um, and they uh, issue various kinds of uh, executive orders um, in response saying, basically, we will not, you know, we do not recognize black men in uniform as legitimate soldiers. Uh, we will view them as slaves inciting rebellion or insurrection and as punishment, right? They will not be, we will not take them as prisoners. We reserve the right to execute them summarily because that's how we treat slaves in rebellion. Um, and if we do have prisoners who are African-American soldiers, we will not exchange them. We will exchange white soldiers only. So of course, Abraham Lincoln is wanting to raise enlistments among black men, both North and South, because as the Union Army is pushing into the South and making inroads along the Atlantic coast and into the Mississippi Valley, they are trying to recruit soldiers from the enslaved populations there as well. Um, so he wants them to feel that, uh, you know, that the Union Army is going to protect them is, and is going to treat them as they would any other soldier, which means demanding that they be involved in any kind of prisoner swaps. Um, and uh, protesting, you know, the idea that they can be executed as rebellious slaves if they are captured. 
So this is why the prisoner exchange breaks down because the Confederate army and the Confederate government refuses to allow black soldiers to be exchanged. So Lincoln's response and the um, response of uh, his military command is if you will not exchange our black soldiers, we will not exchange any soldiers. So it's from this point beginning um, in 1863 that the prisoner exchange effectively stops. That means the populations in both Confederate and Northern Union POW camps begin to swell. So by 1864, when Andersonville prison, this is the reason they have to start using it before it's actually ready to house any soldiers is because there are so many um, Union POWs in Confederate control and they have to try to find some place to put them. Um, and this is why the prisons become so overcrowded. And this affects Northern prison camps as well. And some of them have conditions that are not drastically dissimilar to the to some of the conditions we see in Andersonville. So for instance, probably the most notorious Union POW camp was Elmira in Elmira, New York, um, known uh, among its inmates as Hellmira. Um, and while it was a more sort of complete camp, there were barracks and shelters for the men, um, it was still incredibly overcrowded. Uh, it had roughly the same number of prisoners, high 20,000s, uh, and it wasn't designed to hold that many um, as Andersonville. Uh, there were food shortages because it was very difficult to, to find enough food to feed these men. Uh, there was, you know, issues of sanitation uh, and the spreading of disease, as you would have whenever you have, you know, populations of that size, people all crowded together. And ultimately, Elmira has a death rate of its uh, prisoners not that far behind Andersonville. Andersonville's death rate, like I said, hovers, I think it's like 28, 29% fatalities. Uh, Elmira is about 24 or 25. So it's very high as well. Um, so the breakdown of the prisoner exchange, prison overpopulation, uh, the lack of, of ability to sort of adequately house, feed, or care for prisoners is a problem that both the Union and the Confederate governments are, are having to deal with, okay? So after the war is over um, and the Union Army kind of rolls into Anderson, Georgia, uh, to liberate the camp. And there has been word, they know what they are, where the camp is. They know of the conditions are, that are there. Um, some people had wanted uh, William Tecumseh Sherman when he was making his march through Georgia. Of course, he's over in the eastern part of the state. He goes to Atlanta and then he heads over to Savannah. He's not in the western part of the state where Andersonville is, you know, there was some talk about sending, you know, having him send some troops down to liberate the camp. They didn't do that at the time. Um, but there had been escapees. Um, and so word of the conditions in the camp had made its way back to Union Command. Um, so the, you know, people were aware of, of Andersonville. Um, and had a sense of how bad it was. Of course, no one really understood how bad it was until they get there um, and see it, you know, kind of firsthand. When they arrive, Henry Wirtz uh, is there waiting for them, right? He knows the war is over. He knows, uh, you know, peace has been officially declared. So his expectation is, you know, he just kind of sits there and waits for the Union uh, Army to arrive. And he expects to take a parole, right? He expects to sort of sign his loyalty to the United States uh, and sort of be sent home, be sent on his way. That's what he expects to happen. But that is not what happens. Instead, he is arrested. He is taken back to Washington, D.C. Uh, and he is put on trial for war crimes, for violating the laws of war. 
the man that was prosecuting him was this person, Joseph Holt, who was the judge advocate general of the U.S. Army at the time. He was head of the Bureau of Military Justice, and he prosecuted not only Wirtz, but prior to that, by a few months, um, the people, the co-conspirators uh, uh, of the Lincoln assassins, the people who had been um in planning and helping John Wilkes Booth carry out the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Um, Wirtz was not tried in a civilian court. He was court-martialed. So he's being tried in front of a military commission, uh, an eight-person military commission that was headed by Major General Lou Wallace, this man here. Uh, eventually, uh, Lewis you know, he had a very uh, kind of stellar military career. After the Civil War, he is appointed territorial governor of New Mexico. He becomes the U.S. minister to the Ottoman Empire, very important positions. But perhaps he's best known for being, he was a writer and novelist and the author of Ben-Hur uh, in 1880. So he has a very kind of wide-ranging uh, career, both as uh, a successful soldier, diplomat, uh, politician um, and novelist as well. So Lou Wallace is the head of the eight person military commission that is sitting in judgment of Henry Words. And it's important to make that distinction that this is a military tribunal. Um, so the same rules of one would say, you know, reasonable doubt, things like that, that exist for civilians in a civilian court do not necessarily apply in a military setting for a military tribunal. So the same standards, evidentiary standards, uh, aren't, aren't the same. What was Henry Wurst actually charged with? He was, uh, there were two main or primary charges against him. The first was conspiracy to impair and injure the health of federal soldiers. Uh, and it was a conspiracy charge, mainly because uh, they wanted to make it clear that Henry Wurtz was not the only person responsible for this, but this was a responsibility of the entire Confederate chain of command, um, of the entire, really, the Confederate government for refusing to exchange Black POWs. They were, you know, they were the cause of the breakdown of the prisoner exchange. It was because of that that the prison conditions were so horrible. They sort of recognized that. Uh, and Wirtz, as commandant, as part of this chain of command, bore some responsibility for that. Now, um, the other charges in the second part of the indictment were a little bit different. These charges related to individual acts of murder and of cruelty that Wirtz committed against individual prisoners in violation of the laws of war. There were 13 separate counts or specifications, including torture, binding, beating, shooting, and even using dogs, setting dogs against individual prisoners and calling, causing them death uh, and extreme bodily harm and suffering. So this is not simply about, these charges are not simply about Wirtz sort of being part of this bigger, uh, you know, problem or dilemma about the breakdown of the prisoner exchange and the conditions that exist in Andersonville. This is about individual actions, individual acts of cruelty and violence that he committed, according to the charges, he himself committed or ordered to be committed against individual union, so union prisoners under his command. They are able to charge Wirtz with these crimes because of this man, Francis Lieber, who was the author of the Lieber Code, also known as General Order 100, that was issued in 1863, which basically set out or codified the laws of war as they existed at the time. Francis Lieber was also an immigrant to the United States. He was originally from Germany. 
Uh, he comes to the United States in the 1850s. He is a leading kind of world renowned uh, thinker, a, a particularly like a political, what we would call today, you know, someone he was sort of a political scientist. He was a jurist, a legal thinker. He held positions at Columbia University. Uh, in New York City. He was also for a long time um, at the, I think they call it, it's now the University of South Carolina. Um, it's earlier iteration. Uh, he was there for a long time as well. Two of his sons were in the Civil War. And actually, because he, he his boys had grown up in, when he was in South Carolina, one was in the Confederate service and lost his life. And another was in the Union service and was severely injured. Um, so Francis Lieber knew firsthand uh, about war. He actually had also been a veteran in the Napoleonic Wars in the early 19th century and had been injured at the Battle of Waterloo. So Francis Lieber knew personally. He had been a soldier himself. He had lost his sons uh, to the Civil War. So Lincoln, he's the guy that Lincoln asked to sort of, you know, tell me what are the rules of war? How should war be conducted um, in an efficient way, um, but also in a way that sort of minimizes um, the sort of the destruction and the damage uh, that these kinds of wars uh, can cause? And so Lieber sort of codifies, he collects, he does his research, uh, basically what had been at the time sort of customary or, tr you know, tradition among um, nation states when, you know, when it came to waging war, Lieber collects all of that, writes it down and sort of says, here are, here's basically what quote unquote civilized nations do when they wage war. Um, I think there were in total like 147 separate articles, uh, according to Lieber, basically saying what you can't, what, you know, armies should and should not do. And Article 75 was the one that pertained directly to the treatment of prisoners of war. And it's under this article that the charges against warts are sort of, you know, that lay the foundation for, for the, for the charges against words. So Article 75 says that prisoners of war can be subject to confinement or imprisonment, imprisonment, such as may be deemed necessary on account of safety, but they are not to be subjected to no other, but they are to be subjected to no other intentional suffering or indignity. And the confinement and mode of treating a prisoner may be varied during his captivity according to the demands of safety. So Lieber is sort of recognizing that you can't really have any hard or fast rules about how prisoners would be treated, uh, or you know you can't sort of uh, delineate it too specifically because conditions change, um, and it you know it may be you know you may have five prisoners one day and 105 the next day, and conditions change and war changes very very rapidly. So he understands that and he understands conditions, you know, for prisoners are not going to be nice by any stretch of the imagination. But the important part of Article 75 really has to do about prisoners not being subjected to intentional suffering or indignity, right? So intentional suffering, intentional cruelty um, is really against the Libra code, it is against the laws of war, and it's on this basis, this general basis, that Henry Wirtz is charged with committing crimes against the laws of war. So how did Wirtz defend himself? And he did put on a defense, he had representation. Basically, he sort of made three basic arguments. One, he was following orders. Right. He was put in charge. He was ordered to, you know, oversee uh, this prison camp. And, you know, he did it to the best of his ability. You know, he would say, you know, I asked for more food. I asked for better food, but they didn't send it. So what was I supposed to do? You know, I'm just a captain. Uh, there are other people higher above me who have control over all this stuff. Um, and I couldn't make them send me food. I couldn't make them send me medicine. I couldn't make them do anything. I was just following the orders that I was given. The other part of his defense is that, you know, he says the real problem, the reason this was so bad is because, you know, we were, you know, the 
prisoner exchange system collapsed. And he said, again, that had nothing to do with me. I wasn't in charge of that. Those are people much higher above me uh, who are making these decisions, it had nothing to do with me, but I had to deal with the results and I did the best I could. And finally, when it came to the specific charges that he had shot, beaten, uh, used dogs to torture uh, individual prisoners, and uh, the prosecution had eyewitness testimony for this, um, survivors of the camp who had been there who said, I saw Henry Wirtz do this. I saw the commander. This is what he said. This is what I saw him do. Uh, you know, I witnessed it. I saw it. And they put on several key eyewitnesses who testified to Wirtz's behavior, right? That Wirtz did these things. Um, Wirtz simply said, they're lying. You know, I didn't do that. I couldn't have done that. This is not who I am. I would never have done something like that. You know, they're just trying to, you know, get back at me because the conditions in the camp are so bad and they blame me for it, which is out of my control. And you're just trying to sort of, you know, figure out a way to hold me responsible. They're lying. What was the verdict? He was found guilty on all counts except for three of the murder charges when it was proven that he was not in the camp on the dates of those particular incidents. Okay, so there, you know, Henry Wirtz actually produced sort of a logbook or journal that was kept um, in the prison, sort of said when he was in, when he was out, because he lived near the prison. He, his family actually had a home very close by. Um, and for a period of time, he was quite ill himself for about a month um, and was homesick and didn't come to the prison camp in a particular span of time when the prosecution said three of these acts of cruelty and murder took place. So the panel did not find him guilty for those, but they did find him guilty on all of the other specifications. As a result, Wirtz is sentenced to death. He, uh, before he's executed, he asked President Andrew Johnson to pardon him. Uh, but he do Johnson doesn't do that because, as you can imagine, that would have been an um, incredibly unpopular thing for him to do uh, amongst at least the northern public at the time. So on November the 10th, 1865, Wirtz is executed. This is an actual photograph taken just moments after the door opens under Wirtz's feet. So you can't actually see him at the moment because his body has dropped, but that's the executioner standing up there. Um, under uh, the gallows. And of course, uh, the picture of the Capitol is in the, you know, in the background. And you can see there some in the background as well in the trees. There are people, I think those are soldiers who have climbed up into the trees uh, to be able to see over the walls and see Henry Wirtz executed. Um, there were various um, military and political leaders who were allowed inside the confines here uh, of the execute place of execution, but it wasn't open to the public. But as you can see, many, many people wanted um, to catch a glimpse of Henry Wirtz paying for the crimes they believed he committed. The Henry Wirtz trial um, held uh, has held great importance um, for the legacy of military jurisprudence um, and international law. In particular, at the Duremberg trials uh, in uh, the post World War II period, Allied prosecutors studied the trial, the Henry Wirtz trial, to prepare for what they anticipated, what they called the Wirtz defense, which was basically. I was just following orders, right? This wasn't my plan. I was just, you know, I was just a cog in the wheel. Every, you know, I had to follow the orders that I was given. And, you know, I don't bear any individual responsibility for this, which was, of course, what many of the accused Nazi war criminals argued. Um, and so the allied prosecutors anticipated this. And so they go back and they look for legal precedents where this had happened in the past, they knew about Henry Wirtz and they studied the trial. They studied how the prosecution responded to this. Um, and so this basically helped them prepare uh, for uh, military military jurisprudence. And, you know, after the Wirtz trial and beyond on Nuremberg, 
you know, the sort of the, the excuse that I was just following orders is not considered a legitimate um, sort of excuse uh, for these kinds of acts and behaviors. They said, you know, even a soldier who is, you know, subordinate to others, uh, who's being given orders to do something that they know is immoral or wrong or cruel, um, uh, still has an obligation to a higher authority, uh, whether you want to call that God or just morality or, you know, hu- you know, the kind of the human community more generally. Um, and therefore, you know, a subordinate is not obl- obligated to follow orders that um, he or she now believes to be immoral. In the South, uh, Wirtz is largely con- has been considered a hero or a martyr of the Confederacy, someone who was scapegoated um, for his role, um, you know, as Andersonville Prison. Um, the idea that Wirtz, you know, uh, you know, this this narrative of Wirtz rejects the idea that he was in any way really responsible for the conditions at Andersonville Prison. Um, and that, you know, he was just a scapegoat for the breakdown of this prisoner exchange, which was something that, um, you know, that the Union Army or the Union government, the Northern government, um, also held responsibility for because they they set the terms of the exchange. Um, and as you can see here, this is a marker that exists uh, near the site of, of Andersonville Prison, a historic marker that was commissioned in the 1950s. Or um, uh, that, you know, refers to him, you know, basically as a martyr, um, as a good man who tried to do the best that he could, but who bore no individual responsibility for what happened at Andersonville. Of course, you can see this marker does not mention, right? It kind of ignores those charges that Wirtz himself, right, had wantonly, you know, attacked, assaulted, and even murdered individual Union prisoners under his command. There is also a Confederate monument. We've been hearing in the past few years about these Confederate monuments and uh, their removal, or in some instances, renaming one. To my knowledge, you know, I looked, I tried to find this this monument uh, near the prison um, in honor of Wirtz has not been removed or renamed in any way. Um, it was erected in 1909. Um, by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which was the organization that was responsible for most of the Confederate monuments that you've heard about and maybe seen yourself. Between the 1890s and the 1920s, the UDC, the United Daughters of the Confederacy, erected hundreds, if not thousands, of monuments to kind of just the Confederacy, sometimes particular Confederates, in this case, Henry Wirtz, um, all over, not just the South, but all over the United States. He was also awarded a Medal of Honor by the Sons of Confederate Veterans in 1981. And at a, they do a kind of a, I don't know if they still do it, but at one time, they, every year, they, on the anniversary of his execution in November, they did kind of a memorial service at this monument for Henry Wirtz. Um, at, and at this memorial service in 1984, he was praised by Georgia's former Governor Lester Maddox, who had been an avowed and unapologetic segregationist during the Jim Crow era. Uh, Maddox praised him as a symbol of Southern of virtue, uh, the kind of person who was opposed to the, quote, bums and parasites who received welfare benefits. Um, so that may have been a kind of, uh, you know, a dig, not so veiled dig at uh, African-Americans who were thought to be the primary recipients of welfare benefits. Um, so not not a surprising thing for someone like Maddox really to say. But this just goes to show you how, um, you know, that Wirtz's memory is, is a divisive one and how he has been used or his memory has been used or attempted to be used um, by, uh, by various groups um, who want to 
vindicate the Southern cause, vindicate the Confederacy, um, and and sort of redeem or rehabilitate Wirtz's, um, Wirtz's reputation or his image. 